to the special session on visioning and what I mean by special is that it's really going to be more of a conversation. In fact, unless you want to have a conversation with yourself, this might be something good to watch with another leader or even with some of your leaders within your church. In fact, I'm going to be targeting it towards those of you who lead within churches, uh, in particular those who are senior pastors, uh, executive pastors or youth ministers, children's ministers, any any of those, uh, any of you who actually have leadership responsibilities, elders as well within your congregations. And what I want to do in this particular session is really get you thinking about how do you have a clear cut leadership vision for your congregation. After all, when you think about leadership, perhaps the the psalmist uh, in Psalm 29:18 says said it best where there is no vision or when there's no vision the people will perish and that's true in order for a church to move forward in order for really an organization of any type to move forward but in particular a church we are about visioning and we're about visioning God's vision within the life and the times of the people the context in which we've been called and that's very important to have that vision. You know, when we look around at our culture today, particularly our tech culture, one of the giants of technology is Apple, the Apple Corporation. Uh, Steve Jobs, and who passed away just recently, has did a remarkable job in resurrecting a company which, by the way, in 1994-95 was just about dead. In fact, Michael Dell of Dell Computers essentially predicted and, and, and said outright that Apple should close up its, its doors. It, it was really a non-functioning entity in the tech market at that time. And it's funny because at that point in time, uh, Apple Computers was operating with about a 4 to 5% uh, market share. That means that in 1995, 4%, 5% of, of everybody that was purchasing a computer, they were purchasing a Mac computer. Most of us were purchasing Microsoft operating programs and um, you know, platforms in which to, in which to compute. <laughs> Apple comes along and what happened was they actually rehired Steve Jobs who had been fired a few years earlier, several years earlier, and now they rehired him to come in and re-jumpstart the company. And one of the first things that Steve did was he said to his people, we cannot build a better computer. We believe we've got the best computer already. What we want to do is we want to build something better, something different. In fact, that's what he challenged his entire staff, his entire team at Apple to do. I want you to think different, he said. It became such a, a clarion call within the company that Steve Jobs, um, you know, through this process, getting them to think different, of course, produced eventually uh, the Apple iPad, iPod, which eventually produced iTunes and then the iMac and actually the iMac was a little bit earlier but you had all these different types of machines it's interesting most people don't realize this but the small i that was uh, in iPad or iPod that actually means interim <laughs> Steve Jobs one of his when he came back to Apple he referred to himself as an I CEO an interim CEO he didn't know how long the job was gonna last and from that point on it became almost a running joke within the company iPod everything was I so if you wonder what the I stands for within Apple products it really means interim Isn't that interesting you see, their vision for their company was they were going to continue to move. They were continue to think different. They were not going to stay put. They were not going to be like a Kodak or a Polaroid and realize that they're, they, they are in something bigger than just the film business. They are in the photography business. And Kodak and Polaroid recognized that. They'd still be around today. Apple recognized it. And they, they understood that they were in technology. And that technology didn't necessarily have to be personal computers. Ironically, today, Apple now commands a 48%, really it's almost over 50%, it might be over 50% as I speak now, especially with the iPad and the iPhone and those type of technologies really have shaken things up even further. 
the, the personal laptop is now primarily in the Apple um, market. Uh, most people buy Apple laptops. In the iPod marketplace, iPods command 88% of all the MP3 players that are purchased. See, this is from a company that in 1994, their market share uh, were on, they were trading at that point around maybe 10 to $12, maybe as low as $6. You know, recently was, was market shares were up to around $350. Apple, it's a company and it all comes back to vision. I'd like you to take a moment and watch this early, early Apple commercial. In fact, it came out just after Steve Jobs came back to the job at Apple. And it is appropriately titled, Thinking Different. Take a look. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So, what is vision? If we're going to talk about what is vision let's make sure we have a clear understanding and that's the first point a vision begins by being clear it's not foggy it's not misty it's not obtuse it is clear vision has to be have clarity to it secondly it has to be preferable to the current state many of the reasons why our churches do not grow they do not have vision is because quite frankly they're comfortable they like their current state. They may not. They may say they don't like it, but in truth, when you look at their their procedures, when you look at the policies, when you look at how things are done, it's preferable. That's what they want. Vision is basically realizing that there has to be something better than where you're at right now. Third, it concentrates on the future. Vision is always looking forward. It may not have everything figured out, but it's always moving forward. Fourth, I believe that real vision comes ultimately from God. Ultimately, our ability to create and innovate and think into the future is a divine thing. See, when you think about it, that's what separates God from all other gods. That's what separates God from even, God from even the spiritual entities like angels and demons. Angels and demons and those spiritual beings, they have knowledge of the present and the past, but they do not know the future. The evil one, Satan, does not know the future. But because we're created in the image of God, we are able to actually vision into the future. Now, that doesn't mean we have perfect vision like God does, but it does mean that we can look into the future. And so our vision is from God, ultimately. It's also a gift. I believe vision is a gift that's that's given to the leaders um, in, in, who are entrusted to carry forth the objectives of the organization, to carry forth the, the, the values of the church, the congregation, and it's tailored to their circumstances. This is why you can't run out and, and just buy a box of vision, because vision is different for every church. What works in Boise is going to fail in Boston or maybe not be as good in Boston. You simply cannot box up vision. Vision is also something that reflects a realistic perspective. It's realistic, it has this, this idea, it's, it's grounded in reality. So I mean, it's not pie in the sky type of thinking. It's not head in the clouds type of uh, understanding. It's really going, we know where we're going and we have a realistic perspective on what that means to us. It dreams the most possible dream. <laughs> you 
you know, possible dream. And, and sometimes even a little bit of the impossible. But real vision is not going further than your headlights at night will allow you to go. It's one of the great ways of looking at vision. It's, it's like driving at night. Your headlights only go so far and you drive to that spot and guess what? Your headlights go further, but your headlights do not go forever. It's dreaming the most possible dream. So if you're a church of 200, your most possible dream is maybe to look and benchmark yourself with a church of 500, not a church of 10,000. Too many churches benchmark themselves with, with dreams that are way beyond their vision, way beyond where they can be. But if you just keep thinking the next step ahead, if you're a church of 500, you vision and benchmark with a church of 1,000. If you're a church of 1,000, 1,500 or even 2,000. But you keep benchmarking just a little bit ahead. Get that vision. It dreams the most possible dream. Again, it is built on reality, that realistic perspective, that reality that, hey, listen, we don't have all the volunteers in place right now. We don't have the financial uh, wherewithal to do what we need to do. There's some things we're going to have to do. We're going to pay down some debt, perhaps. We're going to have to, to, to build, some, build some platforms where we assimilate people in. We're going to have to grow a little bit. All those things are built upon reality. A visionary church is a successful church. That's because a visionary church is healthy. A visionary church is one that's not blind. It's, it's not... It, it, it doesn't have cataracts of, of the soul. It's, it's, it's a church that sees where it's going, it knows where it's going, and it has a perspective that is positive. You know, I always say there are three types of people in a church. There are winners, whiners, and wieners. Winners are the visionary type. They are the ones who are constantly looking forward. They're constantly pulling a church forward. The whiners, they're the negative types. They're the ones that have the cataracts. They're the ones that have blinders on. They're the ones who can't see the forest for all of the trees. And some of them are on our leadership staff. And we have to work on either getting them to open their eyes and be enlightened to the vision that's coming, or maybe stepping aside and allowing other leaders to fill the void, for which they're obviously doing a pretty good job at that point anyway, right? What I'd like you to do right now is watch a video by Ken Blanchard, who is a co-author of a book called Full Steam Ahead, and he's going to challenge the idea of values. And I've got some question there, questions there for you to think about as you listen to Ken. He's got some great insights on living out your values, and this is a great opportunity for you. Perhaps you need to stop the tape. Perhaps you just need to, to really just take some time and think about this, but what are your values? And how well can your leaders and your church members articulate the values of your congregation? Take a look. A vision has to be lived. And where it gets lived is in your values. Because that's what's guiding your behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. And so if people aren't living the values, then people say, this is just on the wall. And it starts with the leaders. They got to model the values. But then you got to also make sure your people are. Then they're being held accountable besides you. Gary Ridge at WD40 really feels that he wants people who get good results but are also good citizens. And what are good citizens? They're living according to the values that they've established to guide their behavior. And if they get a top performer who's not living their values, they'll try to work with them but if they can't get them to do it, Gary has this wonderful concept, we share them with the competition. And people got to know that you can't have pockets of your organization that are thumbing their nose on your values and nobody's paying any attention because after a while people will say, this is just for the walls, it's not to be lived. You got to live it if it's going to really make a difference in your lives your organizational lives, and your customers' lives. Aristotle once said that the soul never thinks without a picture. And that is so true. I think the soul thinks with vision in mind. And so let's just take a moment. I want you to think about this question now. What's the difference between vision and mission? What's the difference between vision and mission? And if you got someone there that you can talk about, go ahead and do that. If not, maybe you want to jot down some of your thoughts. What's the difference between vision and mission?
A mission is the big picture. It's the general statement of your objectives. It's it's philosophic. It's dealing with the what, the who, and the where. It's it's really, you know, when you think about when it comes to the church, we are about the great go mission. We're about going into the world. We're about you know, baptizing, we're about preaching, we're about teaching them in the name of Jesus Christ. We're about essentially evangelism, we're essentially about edifying people, we're essentially about equipping them to do works of ministry. That's the big picture. Vision, on the other hand, is a more specific, detailed statement of direction. It's unique. It's more strategic. It really answers the question, how are you going to do that? So mission is like the big barn. Vision is the targets on the barn as far as where you're wanting to go. Does that make sense? So let me give you some myths that tend to mar vision. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but I just want to give you some basic understanding and overview of some of the things that you're going to encounter as you vision within your congregation. Myth number one. Vision should be the result of a consensus among the church's key leaders regarding future activity by the church. No. The reality is this. Vision is not the result of consensus. It should result in consensus, but it's not always the result of consensus. In other words, not everybody's going to agree on the vision, but in the end, everyone agrees, even if they have to disagree, that this is the best approach. In other words, we all get on the ship, we all get on the boat, we all get in the car, whatever metaphor you want to use for transportation here, and you move. You may not like the car you're in, you may not like the ship that you're in, you may not agree with every part of how it's getting done, but you're on board. Another myth that Mars vision is that some leaders are visionary and some are not. Well, that's simply not true because the reality is much different. The reality is that all leaders, by definition, are visionary. If you're not a visionary leader, you're really not leading. Leaders all, by definition, have to be visionary. They have to be looking forward. They have to be going somewhere. Myth number three. Myth number three is the purpose of vision is to estimate future realities than to operate within those parameters. The purpose of vision is to estimate future realities than to operate within those parameters. Well, that's a myth because the purpose of vision is to create the future. You know, we don't always know all those specific parameters. We do our best as we vision, but we don't always know all the realities. In fact, sometimes as we're moving forward, crisis and trouble and tribulation, recession, all sorts of other things can happen economically, socially, within the context of our neighborhoods where our churches are operating, within the wider context of, of just the people, you know, changes, transitions, and they change who we are. And so our vision has to change accord, uh, accordingly to move forward. Myth number four is that strategy and vision are often confused. In reality, vision is conceptual, strategy is practical and detailed. That is simply a myth. That's not true. In reality, vision is conceptual, but it's also practical and detailed as well. Vision is conceptual. It's it, it gives some abstract ideas. This is where we want to go. And yes, it can be a little foggy, but don't think that that fog does not have some some trees in it. it doesn't have some handles to it that you can hold on to. It has to have some practicality to it. It has to have some detail to it, to the vision. Vision is conceptual, but it's also practical and detailed in nature. Myth number five, real vision. Real vision protects the church from risk. <laughs> right. Real vision protects the church from risk. That is simply not true. The reality is risk is a natural and unavoidable outgrowth of vision. If you are having vision at all within your church, if your church has got a forward moment, movement at all, if it's looking towards the future, guess what? There's risk there. If you're going to change, if you're going to charge into the unknown, you have to recognize that there's going to be risk involved. But that's the beauty of following a God who sees, a God who comforts, a God who provides, and a God who protects. Because that God, vision, is what works within him. He, he's, he's the champion of risk. Another myth 
that mars vision is that the goal of vision for church ministry is numerical growth i want to camp on this one for a moment because too many churches think the reason we do the things we do the reason we want to have some vision is we want to grow numbers and not true not true the absolute goal of vision is to glorify god it's about church health not church growth you see any fool can really grow a church any charismatic personality can grow numbers but church health depends upon vision that's powerful vision that's positive and vision that's personal it, it changes people from the individual perspective that then changes small groups the community and ultimately the congregation the absolute goal of vision is to glorify God not ourselves the seventh myth that Mars vision is that if it is truly God's vision for ministry capturing that vision will be a simple quick process so if this thing's of God then it's gonna be easy to capture we're gonna know exactly what we need to do truth is God's vision is not constrained by time simply not it's it's a myth God's vision is not constrained by time there some things that we, we vision may take may take years when what we thought would take only months some things that we think will take months may end up taking just weeks or maybe even days God's vision is not constrained by time in fact one of my favorite praise songs of all time is in his time he makes all things good he makes all things perfect he makes all things well within his time in his time another myth that Mars vision is that a church's vision needs to be recreated every couple of years it needs to be recreated a church's vision needs to be reinvented every few years well that's a myth because vision usually outlasts the visionary who's doing the dreaming in your church whoever's dreaming it probably will be gone before the vision is actually completed and if it's true that you need to have another vision it's because your dreamer has stopped dreaming so recognize that the reality is that vision usually does outlast the visionary take a moment right now and let's watch this uh, short video clip from Jack Welch who's the chairman and CEO of General Electric back in uh, from 1981 to 2001 so for about 20 years he was chairman and CEO and listen to what he says about vision Mr. Welch, I haven't heard the word vision yet tonight, and I teach a class on, on leadership. And one of the things that we talk often about is the importance of a leadership vision. And I'm wondering if when you use the word focus, if you're also talking about having a leadership vision. Or oh, do you yeah. think a vision is even important at all? No, I think a vision is very important. I think, you know, we were in a, a potpourri of businesses, some 300 plus businesses. Uh, early, early on, I said you got to be number one and then number two, or fixed. Uh, sell or close the business was very helpful. In that, in in you got to have a vision because you've got to rally people around a cause, and and, and your vision is uh, it shouldn't be complicated, it should be simple, and uh, it should be repeated until you want to gag on it. Over and over and over again. Visions are a little bit like ads. Corporate ads. The CEO gets sick of seeing them because he's seen them four times. The public hasn't seen them enough yet, so he wants to change them. And visions are a little boring. And, and the CEO likes to get a, let, let's get a new vision thing. You know, vision and initiatives are another thing. We've had four in 20, 20 years: globalization, uh, services, Six Sigma, and e-business. You know, four in 20 years. That's monotonously boring to some. On, on the other hand. They drive through the organization and they grow like mushrooms. So I think the biggest thing about a vision is simplify it and relentlessly repeat it and rally people around it. Let me speak very briefly now about the character of God's vision. What's God's vision for a church? Well, when you capture God's vision for your ministry, it will have predictable, specific qualities. That's the character of God's vision. God's vision is inspiring. It always pumps you up. It always gets you excited. God's vision is, is a means of, of describing the activity and the development of the ministry. That's what vision is. The character of God's vision 
is that God's vision for you will cause you to go beyond the limitations you assumed were obstacles. What you see as a problem is rich, pregnant with possibility. What you see as an obstacle is actually filled with opportunity. Vision is empowering. Vision is empowering. That's the nature of God's vision. That's the character of God's vision. God has created a personal vision that fits your church perfectly. Do you, th do you realize that? As you start to think about where you're going with your congregation, God has created a personal vision that fits your church perfectly. And that's why, again, you can't buy it. You can't sell it. <laughs> uh, vision doesn't come in a box. It comes when we literally think beyond the boxes. Vision is detailed. That's the character of God's vision. It has, it has some, some points to it. It has some grips to it. It has some handles to it. Vision is always people-oriented. This is what I love most about Christianity. Christianity is such a communal uh, religion. It's such a communal, community-oriented type of faith. We are people-oriented, and so vision has to be people-oriented as well. So let me ask you a question, and I want you to take some time. This might be another one of those opportunities for you to stop the tape and just really think about it. But where do you see your church in 10 years, or 25 years, or 100 years? Have you thought about that? Well, take a moment. Maybe you want to write down you know, 10 years, 25 years, 100 years. Where do you see your congregation? All right, let me close this particular session by talking about branding for a moment. And I have a friend here in Boise by the name of Justin Foster, and he, he wrote a great book on this, so I, 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 I've stolen it from him, and I, I want you to know that up front. But Justin Foster, he's talking to business people, but I think it has huge implications for us within the church. Essentially, what, what he asks is, is your brand oatmeal or is it bacon? Now think about your church. Think about how other people look at your brand. I mean, when you think about oatmeal, it's healthy, it's good for you, obviously, but also when you think about it, it's safe. <laughs> it's pretty safe. It's, it's boring. Oatmeal by itself, there's nothing there. It's pretty bland. In fact, it really needs sweets to, to dress it up. If you want to make it good, you have to put in some, some sweetener. You have to put in some milk. You have to, you know, whether it's brown sugar or some fruit of some sort, that's the only way to make oatmeal palatable. And some of our church brands are the same way. This is one of the reasons why we don't grow. This is one of the reasons why we don't have impact and influence within our communities. It's because we've gotten safe. We're boring. We're bland. And our people outside the church, when they look at our congregations, they go, why would I want to join that? Why would I want to try to be a part of something like that? On the other hand, what Justin Foster recommends is that we need to think like bacon. Is your brand more like bacon? I mean, we think about break, bacon, it's unique. It's unique. There's, not, there's no other meat that's like bacon. It sizzles. I mean, even right now, the smell and the, the sizzle of bacon is probably going off in your ears and in your nose. You can, you can even taste it. For those of you who like bacon, it's very experiential. Brands today have a way of sizzling. They have a way of being experiential. They have a way of, of inviting you in to a journey where you can have, you can make a difference. Bacon though is fairly simple. It's also curious. It draws people. And what I like about bacon is it's the only meat that you put on other types of meat. I mean, think about it. A lot of us like to have bacon on a burger. It's not that the burger's bad, it's just that bacon makes it better. That's what you need to be thinking about when it comes to your congregation. How do you, how are you like bacon to your community? How are you like bacon and, and, that, and that you sizzle and that you're curious and that you're simple and that you're unique, that you're different? Again, thinking different, that's how you get it done. That's how you make a difference. That's how you influence people and draw them in to your congregation. And that's why positive, powerful churches, productive churches, churches that grow and see traction within their community, within their culture, they are bacon. They have figured it out. They know what their brand is and they do it. They do it well. They serve it up well. Let me give you some vision killers now. Here's some vision killers that come along that can really uh, kill what you're doing and really 
deter and detract and distract and really delay vision in general. I think we know all about these already. But tradition, tradition kills vision. You know, the seven last words of the church, we've never done it that way before. That's tradition. Tradition is like a rut, and ruts can become like graves, which is the ends knocked out. We've got to be careful about tradition. Tradition always moves us forward into the future, and there's nothing wrong with holding on to the past, but that future is moving forward. I, I like what my mentor Leonard Sweet talks about when he, he mentions tradition. He says that th the way to look at it is we have our anchor. Our anchor holds us fast. We know we have an anchor in Christ, but if you understand visioning, what you do is you take that anchor up and you throw it forward into the future and then you pull yourself using the anchor, you pull yourself towards and uh, move forward. An anchor should hold you, but it should hold you as you're moving forward along it. Does that make sense? That's where tradition works. Traditionalism is dead. Tradition is alive. Second vision killer is fear. I mean, how many of us have stopped doing what we know God has called us to do because we're simply afraid? How many churches have closed their doors? 75 churches will close their door this Sunday alone, and a lot of it's been rooted in fear over the years of not wanting to take risks. Stereotypes are vision killers. We often don't want to be stereotyped with maybe another congregation in town. Well, if we change our name, we're going to be just like them. Or if we do it this way, we're going to be, you know, they're going to, we're going to be seen as a type. And we don't want to be those stereotypes. Well, the problem is, if you're a boring, bland church, you're already a stereotype. And that kills vision. Complacency kills vision as well. Complacency, apathy, all of these. The idea that I don't care, or we don't care anymore. Nothing destroys vision faster than complacency. Fatigue can kill vision. We're just simply tired. We're tired, at it. and this is what I see in a church that's basically near death. They're simply tired. They cannot continue any further. They're done. Short-term thinking. You see, a lot of us, all we do is we want to just think in the short term. We just want to think for the next few minutes, just for the next year. But we have to be thinking longer than that. Effective vision is going forward. I think a great vision should have a five-year, a 10-year, and a 25-year plan uh, put into place. You should know where you're going for the next 25 years. You know, you're going to have to change that. It's very good, very good possibility you'll have to change that. But short-term thinking is a killer of vision. Now let me talk about the cost of vision. Capturing the vision can be a lonely and exhausting process, so there is a cost to it. Just recognize that. God's vision for your church and her ministry may require new skills, new systems, new facilities, new hires. That's going to be costly to you. Some leaders and people may no longer feel called to the ministry or to the new vision. Expect Satan to confront your church as you strive to gain God's vision. You don't think Satan is not gonna take notice of you if you start doing some things right, if you start visioning within God's vision for your community and within your culture? You don't think Satan's not gonna to wanna to attack that? He will, that's gonna be a cost. So, when it comes to visioning, when it comes to visioning, it's all about looking forward in faith. Looking forward in faith. Faith that God is gonna come through. God is a protector. God is a provider. We do not know the future, but we know who holds the future. We like to preach it, but visioning actually forces us to live it. Visioning, it's the starting spot. 
to going forward.